All right, we are ready to go ahead and get started. So I've given you two sheets. Uh, you've got, the, got your usual packet, and then the second sheet, just a single sheet under that. This is my gift to you for today, and I don't want to lie, because I don't like to lie, but I think we'll finish our Old Testament study today. So this is, uh, this is your dessert, I guess. Uh, this, I did not write this. This is taken directly from the book that we've kind of been following, um, Concordia's Bible History. And uh, it's their summary of what happens between the Old and the New Testament. That's a period that I find most people really don't know anything about. And it actually is really very fascinating. And it gives you a lot of important background for the New Testament uh, when Jesus is finally born. So you can take that home and pour over it because I don't think we'll be able to talk about it. Um, but uh, so we'll try to do what we can do today. So before we do that, well, I suppose we should pray. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given in our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. All right, before we look at Old Testament things, is there anything that you wanted to share, ask about, reflect upon about the Sermon on Sunday? We heard the parable of the tenants, and then we heard about Jesus being the stone. And you either get broken to pieces, or you get crushed. And you actually want to be broken. I bet you didn't know that. Anything about that? All right, well, hopefully you were thoroughly broken and mended, because that's always the, always the goal of preaching. All right, well, let's get to it. Just to show you where we are and where we're going, did give you a timeline. Uh, what we've talked about so far when it comes to the Jewish people's return from the Babylonian captivity is we heard about how the Persian king Cyrus the Great allowed the Jews to return to Jerusalem. He allowed them to rebuild the temple. That's finally done after some setbacks. And those two events, that was the first part of the book of Ezra. So we looked at that two weeks ago, which roughly the first six chapters. Then we took a break because chronologically what happens next in the Bible is the story of Esther uh, that we did last time when Esther marries the the later Persian king, Ahasuerus, and then God uses those events to save the Jewish people um, in the Persian Empire. So where we're picking up today is then the second part of the book of Esther, and then also uh, the end of the book of Nehemiah. So you can see between Cyrus in 539-538 and 458, uh, that's a period of, what, 80 years, I suppose, uh, that Ezra actually arrives in Jerusalem. So we'll talk about Ezra being sent by the next Persian king who follows Ahasuerus, that's Artaxerxes. And then a little later on in 445, Nehemiah arrives, he becomes the governor um, of Judah. And then the thing that we'll end with, although it's not strictly historical narrative, is it's around the time that Nehemiah is in Jerusalem that uh, the prophet Malachi prophesies and his are the last words in the Old Testament, and they set us up perfectly for what immediately follows when you turn the page uh, to the Gospel of Matthew. Because something Malachi talks about is listed down there, the point that we've been getting to for the last two years, uh, which is Jesus' birth in Bethlehem, which is around 6 or 5 B.C. Because remember, the, the calendar was a little screwed up. So he was born before himself. He was born before Christ. So, they want to go back and fix it, which, you know, would kind of throw everything off anyway. So that's where we are, where we're going. Anything about that in terms of review before we look at Ezra? Okay. 
we are going to have to do some summary. Hope you won't mind. You can always read Ezra, Nehemiah, any time. But uh, we will read some of it. Skip around a little bit. We'll get the sense of what's going on. So Ezra 7. So now we're after, after everything that happens with Esther. In around 458 B.C. So beginning in the first verse in Ezra chapter 7. Now after this, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Sariah, and then you have his whole genealogy right there. Down to verse 6, this Ezra went up from Babylonia. He was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that the Lord, the God of Israel, had given, and the king granted him all that he asked, for the hand of the Lord his God was on him. And there went up also to Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king some of the people of Israel, and some of the priests and Levites, the singers and gatekeepers, and the temple servants. And Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. All right, so if we stop right here for a second. Ezra is a scribe. Um, he lives in Persia. As a scribe, he is a, he's a teacher of the law, so he's well-versed in the scriptures. Uh, whatever the circumstances are, he has a good relationship with the Persian king. And we've seen this now several times with the, the faithful exiles uh, from Judah. We've seen it with Daniel, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, and we'll see this with Nehemiah too, that a lot of these men who are faithful to the God of Israel, God blesses and he puts them in these positions of authority. So Ezra has the ear of the king and uh, the king grants him not only to return to Jerusalem, but uh, he takes with him, this is kind of the second wave of the exiles who are returning uh, from captivity. And the other thing is he basically bankrolls the whole endeavor because they need, they need money and they need uh, animals to sacrifice in the temple. So this is just kind of Artaxerxes' gift to Ezra. And that's really all that we know about it. So he sends him on his way. Um, and this is explained a little more in 11. Now remember, Ezra is, because it's an historical book, uh, the author of Ezra does draw from historical sources. So Ezra and Nehemiah are filled with these quotations, you know, these other ancient documents. Uh, that, uh, that gives you some of the, the sources for what they're talking about. So in 11, this is a copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave to Ezra the priest, the scribe, a man learned in matters of the commandments of the Lord and his statutes for Israel. So here's the letter. Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ed, well, he's humble, so that's good. Uh, to Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, peace. And now I make a decree that any one of the people of Israel or their priests or Levites in my kingdom who freely offers to go to Jerusalem may go with you. For you are sent by the king and his seven counselors to make inquiries about Judah and Jerusalem according to the law of your God which is in your hand and also to carry the silver and gold that the king and his counselors have freely offered to the God of Israel whose dwelling is in Jerusalem with all the silver and gold that you shall find in the whole province of Babylonia, and with the free will offerings of the people and the priests, vowed willingly for the house of their God that is in Jerusalem. With this money, then, you shall with all diligence buy bulls, rams, and lambs, with their grain offerings and their drink offerings, and you shall offer them on the altar of the house of your God that is in Jerusalem. Whatever seems good to you and your brothers to do with the rest of the silver and gold you may do according to the will of your God. The vessels that have been given you for the service of the house of your God you shall deliver before the God of Jerusalem. And whatever else is required for the house of your God which it falls to you to provide you may provide it out of the king's treasury. So that's fairly generous. Uh, the other pattern that we're kind of following here is you see Artaxerxes, uh, for reasons that really aren't clear, I mean you kind of know ultimately, but uh, he has an interest in uh, the temple being rebuilt. So he's very much like Cyrus in this respect. That uh, The Bible talks about how Cyrus was raised up in order for God's people to be sent back um, to their land. 
And it's the same thing that happens here then, that uh, they, they've begun to return, they've rebuilt the temple, um, and now there's, there's other improvements and renovations and things like that uh, that need to be done. So once again, and something that we see throughout this period, is that God uses the foreign rulers and men who really don't, it doesn't seem that they, they fully acknowledge or worship the God of Israel, but he uses them for his purposes. So it's, it's that kind of thing that's repeating again and again. So Ezra is really going for, for two reasons. He, he's taken the people, he's taken the loot, and then he's also going to teach the people. And this is something that, again, that we see throughout uh, this story, and it's something that's worth remembering, is that their, their problems are not going away because they get to go back to Jerusalem and they rebuild the temple. Uh, the people are always in dire need of the teaching of God's word. The other thing that we've seen, just kind of a broken record at this point, but uh, the, the people always find, somehow they find a way to disobey, transgress, forget, and so, you know, first Ezra goes to kind of clean this situation up, and Nehemiah does a lot of that um, in the same respect. So where we kind of end in the Old Testament is uh, Nehemiah's second trip to Jerusalem. They've screwed up almost everything that Ezra put in place. And so Nehemiah's like, so he tries to fix it as best he can, and he just ends with a prayer. He's just like, remember me, oh my God, for my good. Um, which is a commentary on the nature of sin, but it also shows that, that even when God's people have everything that they're supposed to have, they're in their land, they've got their temple, they've got their worship, they've got the scriptures, uh, th this, is not, this is not a permanent solution, which again kind of sets us up for Jesus coming when he fulfills all these things. Any questions, any comments? Where are you? <laughs> Well, I don't know. Um, I stopped. Let's see. Yeah, yeah. At twenty-one, chapter seven. Yes, ma'am. All right. And in fact, does anybody else want to read? Do you want to read that next paragraph, twenty-one to twenty-four? Okay. Now I, King Artaxerxes, order all the treasures of trans Euphrates to provide with diligence whatever Ezra the priest, the teacher of the law of the God of heaven, may ask you. Up to a hundred talents of silver, a hundred cores of wheat, a hundred baths of wine, a hundred baths of olive oil, and salt without limit. Whatever the God of heaven has prescribed, let it be done with diligence for the temple of the God of heaven. Why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and of his sons? You are also to know that you have no authority to avoid taxes, tributes, or duties, or any of the priests, on any of you. Levites, singers, gatekeepers, temple servants, or other workers of this house of God. Okay, thank you. So again, there's a description of uh, Artaxerxes' generosity. Not only does he give him all this stuff, but then he says, my personal favorite part, it's not lawful to impose tribute, custom, or toll on any of these people. It's a pretty good deal. I mean, that's a long trip uh, because uh, now Kays had trans-Euphrates, which is a little more specific. It, what it, literally, it's beyond the river. So in the minds of the Persians, whatever's beyond the Euphrates, that's the land of Judah. So it's, it's kind of a hike from, I guess that would be, today it'd be northwestern Iraq over the Euphrates into the Holy Land. So along the way, there's to be no custom tax or toll. It's pretty good. I was not in my best humors when I was coming back from New York because uh, why Ohio needs a turnpike, I'm not going to speculate about. But uh, you know, you drive up there with the Michigan plate, and I guess I was mistaken. I'm waiting, waiting, waiting. I'm like, there's nobody at this toll booth. Finally, this lady comes over and she's like, did you know you're in the easy pass only lane? I said, no, I thought it was one over. She's like, oh, no, that's okay, that's okay. So I'm like, I'm going to pay you either way to drive your stupid roads. So I didn't say that. But anyway, it would be nice to make long trips like that and not have custom toll or tribute. So, but... Uh, I 
I mean, that's what they say. Um, I don't know. It wasn't horrible driving, I'll admit to that. But, um, yeah. Are people not taxed enough to pay for their own roads? This is the question that I always have. But uh, anyway, who will neglect the roads, the government or the people, I wonder? All right, so anyway, uh, now something Ezra does then, um, you see in 27, uh, he lapses because I, it does seem there's a lot of first person going on here throughout the story. It would seem that at least this part of the book of Ezra comes directly from Ezra himself. But he kind of lapses into this, this praise of God the way that Nehemiah will frequently, when he's telling his story, he, he inserts all these prayers. So Ezra says, Blessed be the Lord, the God of our fathers, who put such a thing as this into the heart of the king. Right? In the same way that he did this for Cyrus. That, that God moved Cyrus to allow the Jews to return um, and to rebuild the temple. And Artaxerxes has been moved by God uh, to, as it says here, to beautify the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. 28, and who extended to me his steadfast love before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty officers. I took courage for the hand of the Lord my God was on me and I gathered leading men from Israel to go up with me. What follows in chapter 8 is uh, it's the genealogical record of the families and the men that return to the Holy Land with Ezra. So it is true. If you want to, if you want to reach your goal of reading the Bible in a year, you do have to read every word. <laughs> you get to the book of Chronicles, it's like you know 20 chapters of just this person, the son of that person, the son of that person. But that's not our goal today, so we can kind of skip over it and just be thankful, I guess, that, uh, that God preserved the exact history of his people, you know, for us to see. Now, as he's going, there, there are certain things that they need. You know, they are not returning to Jerusalem half-cocked. Uh, they need Levites. And remember the Levites, the tribe of Levi, uh, the sons of Levi were supposed to administer the temple. Now, within... Uh, the sons of Levi, if we could call them that. You had to be whose son, though, to specifically serve as a priest to offer the sacrifices. Had to be the descendant of the first high priest who was brother of Moses. Aaron. Yes. So to be a priest, you had to be descended from Aaron because Aaron himself was a Levite. Well, Ezra, who, again, making this trip, you know, a lot of toll roads, even though they're free, going over the Euphrates, he's not going to go to Jerusalem without making sure they have the priesthood. So they go around, and you see that in the next part of chapter 8. They make sure that they have Levites uh, to take with them. And then uh, verse 21. Does anybody, would anybody else like to read? And that would be, and this is now 8, by the way. Chapter 8, 21 uh, through 23. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God, to seek from him a safe journey for ourselves, our children, and all our spirits. For I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers and horsemen to protect us against the enemy on our way, since we had told the king, the hand of our God is for good on all who seek him, and the power of his wrath is against all who forsake him. So he fasted and implored our God for this, and he listened to our entreaty. All right, thank you. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Ezra gets what he wants from the king, and Ezra, being a faithful man, he says, well, God, God will protect us on the way. So then he feels kind of sheepish about going to the king and being like, uh, can you send us a bodyguard? It's like, do I, do I really believe God's going to take care of me? It's, it's the old thing. It's dumb, you know, but it's like you believe God will take care of you, but you still wear a seatbelt, right? But nevertheless, Ezra's like, I, I'd be embarrassed to ask. So instead what they do, and this is a good thing to do, they pray and they fast and they ask God for a safe journey. Um, have you ever been on a trip, church trip or something, uh, you ever prayed a service called uh, the itinerary? You ever heard of that? 
There's not one in our hymnal, which I think is really regrettable, but uh, it's a very short little prayer service. And I've done it a couple of times now, like when I go to conferences. It's basically prayers for travelers, um, which, you know, should always pray, uh-huh. right? Uh, every time we get in the car, we try with our kids. Uh, what do we say? I can't even remember. You know, God protect us. That's basically it. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's a little service like that. You know, the pastor or layperson could, could lead or whatever. Um, and you, you pray for all of these things. Safe travel, good weather, protection on the roads, um, peaceful home going, things like that. So they're kind of praying their itinerary here. You know, there is an old saying. It's a Jewish saying, apparently. Lord, hear not the prayer of the traveler. Why would that be? What does the traveler want? No rain. Right? You don't want it to rain on you. The farmer wants the rain. So the farmer prays, Lord, hear not the prayer of the traveler. But uh, you and I, I, usually we pray for some propitious weather. So that's what they do. Uh, the, that's right. That'll get you there one way or another. <laughs> Nearer my God to thee. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, yes. So he'll, uh, he'll get you there one way or another. You should wear your seatbelt, I think. But, uh, all right, so that's what they do. They pray and they fast. And God hears their prayer, delivers them safely. And then, let's see, we get to Jerusalem. Let's see, well, if we pick up in 31, then we departed from the river Ahava, and that's in Babylon, on the 12th day of the first month to go to Jerusalem. The hand of our God was on us, and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and from ambushes by the way. We came to Jerusalem, and there remained three days. On the fourth day, within the house of our God, the silver and the gold and the vessels were weighed into the hands of Merimoth, the priest, son of Uriah, and with him was Eleazar, the son of Phinehas, and with them were the Levites, Josabad, the son of Jeshua, and Nodiah, the son of Benui. The whole was counted and weighed, and the weight of everything was recorded. At that time, those who had come from captivity, the returned exiles, offered burnt offerings to the God of Israel, 12 bulls for all Israel, 96 rams, 77 lambs, and as a sin offering, 12 male goats. All this was a burnt offering to the Lord. They also delivered the king's commissions to the king's satraps and to the governors of the province beyond the river, and they aided the people and the house of God. All right, so they've arrived, got to the temple, They've uh, offered their sacrifices of thanksgiving. So now everything should be good, right? Did they get to eat all that they burned, or did they just have that much? Um, you get, uh, the, the priests would get a portion of it. That was kind of their living. And, uh, yeah, the majority of it, the good stuff, see, because they love fat. They don't have this thing about fat like we do. So they burned, they burned the really fatty parts to God. Um, and then the, the priest got a little bit of a, of a portion of that. And I think sometimes the worshipers, too. So nothing went to waste, you know. They walked a lot, too. But that's right. what they're living for. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they didn't have yeah. cars to dump them and die. Mm-hmm. 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 Caitlin and I have had that talk before. You know, we've known some older folks in our lives, older than y'all, you know, actual older folks. And... Uh, you know, you know those people in your life where it's like, man, they like, they smoked a pack a day and they died at 100 in great health with no, like, how does this happen? So Caitlin's whole thing is like, well, they had more of their lives before, like, processed food and refined sugars and all this stuff. I'm like, oh, well, I, I thought longevity was just kind of random, but I guess there's no hope for me then. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, okay, so you would think, you, that's right, all in the hands of the Lord. So. Yeah, there you go. I mean, quality of life also factors into that, I guess. But yes, so they arrive and immediately we have problems. Now, the problem that they have in chapter 9. Did we skip something? I feel like we did. 
No, we've not. Never mind. I lied. The problem we have in chapter 9 is, I think, this is probably one of the major difficulties in the Bible. And by difficulty, I just mean it's a, it's a difficult thing for us to quite understand and to fit together with everything that we know um, about, uh, well, specifically is about marriage, because they have a problem. And uh, Ezra, when he's here to clean house and everything, he realizes that the people, at least a lot of the people, and this includes the leaders, the Levites, the priests, have intermarried. Now, intermarriage in the Old Testament, we talk about intermarriage, uh, the concern is not the same thing as in modern times when people have a problem with what they call intermarriage. Uh, that's not really the concern of the Bible. So maybe we should look at that first, and then we'll talk about the, the difficulty that we have with this. So chapter 9. So they got all their stuff, you know, brought back the silver, the gold, no toll. They're in the temple, offered their sacrifices. So you would think Ezra's in a pretty good mood. After these things had been done, the officials approached me, Ezra, and said, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands with their abominations, from the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters to be wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race has mixed itself with the peoples of the lands. And in this faithlessness, the hand of the officials and chief men has been foremost. Okay, so this is the problem. I did give you the quote. This was from an awfully long time ago now. But when the people of Israel were going to go into the promised land, after they'd been liberated from Egypt, God's giving them instructions. This begins uh, kind of halfway on page three. This was God's prohibition against intermarriage. He says to them in Deuteronomy, you shall not intermarry with them. And what you have in Deuteronomy is a list very much like this one. Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, you know, all of those ites. Uh, you will not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons. And here is the reason, and this is the problem that Ezra sees. For they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you, and he would destroy you quickly. I think one of the problems, and I don't know what the NIV says, one of the problems with our translation, with the ESV, is you can see it. If you look in verse 2 in Ezra, the 9-2, when they come to Ezra with their problem, they have taken some of their daughters to be wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race has mixed itself with the peoples of the lands. Now in the ESV, we have a little footnote, you see by the word race. Uh, that's an awfully fraught and kind of modern word. They should not have put race, because that's not the word that's there. You go down to the footnote, Hebrew is offspring. Now, more literally, because that's still not literal enough, uh, the word is seed. And we've talked about the seed the whole time. So I guess today's a good day to, to mention it again, since we're at the end of all of this. Remember, the first promise of the Messiah's coming was made to Adam and Eve. The ESV says offspring, that's fine, but the word is seed. When God promises, well, first he threatens the serpent after Adam and Eve have eaten the fruit. He says, I will put enmity, I'll put adversarial relationships between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and he will strike your head and you shall bruise his heel. So the seed with a capital S, that's what we've been following the whole time. We're going through the history, the lineage, the genealogy, because eventually, you know, from the tribe of Judah, Jesus is born. That's the seed. You know, it's continued through the generations. So I, I don't like the word race there because it says you're mixing races. And it's like, this is not the same thing, okay, as people, you know, who had a problem with loving versus Virginia and things like that. Uh, 
you can say there's a racial component, but what is what the actual difference between these races of people is that these people worship the true God and these people are idolaters. So it's not a, it's not a carte blanche thing about marrying people outside of your ethnicity or skin color. Uh, like with every decision you made in life, I think everybody here has already made theirs, but uh, when you decide who to marry, you should use wisdom and discernment with every decision you make, you know? So that's all, all I really have to say about that part of it. But the problem is, what is the thing that fundamentally distinguishes these people? And the reason that God said, don't marry these people, that sounds great, don't, don't marry these foreigners, is because the foreigners don't worship the one true God. And the problem is, not only do they not worship the one true God, but uh, you know how it is when you get married, you kind of rub off on each other, one way or another, <laughs> for better or for worse. And uh, God's, God's concern is that his people, when they enter into these kind of marriages, they be led away from faith and worship of the one true God. And then, of course, you know it has that trickle-down effect, because what happens you don't worship God anymore. Exactly why would your son or daughter, you know? It's just, that's how it goes. Um, I'm painting all of that with a broad brush, but uh, the, princ the principle is general, but you see the problem. And this is how it shakes out a good bit of the time, right? So, and you know from our extensive study of the Old Testament, who is the greatest example of violating God's command and doing just this. And he married not only one foreign wife, but he married about, I don't know, like 200 of them. And it, yeah, not, for all his faults, not David. David always stayed with those good Jewish girls the way his mom said. <laughs> Solomon, yeah. yeah, Solomon, he had his whole harem, you know. It started with the daughter of the Pharaoh, and then he just, just had a thing and he kept going. And it, and it says, you know, it was his wives that turned his heart from the Lord. And the things that Solomon did, it says he did it to please his wives. It doesn't say, I had this really like, I had this philosophical problem, you know, with worshiping the God of Israel. Now I just don't believe in him anymore. He was appeasing them. He was keeping the peace. He was getting things in return. And that's, that problem is why God then told Solomon, I'm going to divide your kingdom. That will happen in your son's reign. That's why we, we had all these other problems we talked about. We've got the kingdom of Israel separate from the king of Judah. It was because of Solomon's unfaithfulness. That's the problem. Uh, I did give you some examples just to show that this is what this is really about. Uh, Moses did not marry a nice Jewish girl. He married a, a Midianite. Um, her name was Zipporah. It's not a problem because Zipporah worshipped the one true God. Ruth, who we've talked about, she was a Moabite. She was not an Israelite, uh, but she married Boaz, and Jesus is descended by blood. The seed goes through Ruth uh, to Jesus our Lord. So that's, that is what that is about. Uh, you can see some of the applications then in our lives. Obviously not a popular thing to say. Uh, use wisdom and discernment when making major life decisions. But uh, the thing that, that is difficult, though, about this, maybe I should stop. Before I say the actual difficult thing, is there anything that you want to say or ask? My family's been really creative. Really creative? <laughs> A lot of foreign wives? Yeah, yeah, I've heard parents say things like that before. Um, so we preach best what we need most, I guess. But uh, I will say, you, you understand that I am definitely, if we're talking about colors, and I'm definitely no opponent of interracial marriage because I married somebody who was Polish. <laughs> <You know? laughs> 
I know all white people basically look the same, but you can't tell me that Poles are the same kinds of people as those of us who are, you know, Anglo-Saxon. But anyway, it's just a joke, it's just a joke. <laughs> Obviously very different, you know, but uh, it's all good. Yeah, so, but that's the main thing, right? I mean, this is the main thing, is uh, are they going to, they're united in marriage, or are they going to be united in their faith, and what does that have to do, you know, then for their family and the people of God? Okay, anybody else? Anybody else in an interracial marriage here? <laughs> uh. Oh, well, you know, it's America, you know, we celebrate Christmas in America. They like getting the holidays off, too, so, yep, and Jewish folks make a lot of money in the department store, so I don't think they're complaining, but anyway, all right, enough of that, before I say something I shouldn't say. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, God has made a wonderful tapestry of all different kinds of people, hasn't he? So, all right. So the actual problem, though, is what it is that uh, God wants the people to do. Ezra is very upset by this news. And Ezra fasts and prays and weeps. And he goes and he, you know, seeks God's face. And he's like, we just screwed all of this up. God's been favorable to us in this little moment. He's brought us back to the land, rebuilt the temple, all of this stuff. And now because of the faithlessness of the people, he's going to blow us out of the water. So that's Ezra's concern. Um, what they do then is he summons the people and the leaders. And you can see, let's begin in verse 10, in chapter 9. And now, O our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments, which you commanded by your servants, the prophets, saying, and this is basically Deuteronomy that we saw, the land that you are entering, to take possession of it is a land impure with the impurity of the peoples of the lands, with their abominations that have filled it from end to end with their uncleanness. So you see, it's a spiritual concern. Therefore, do not give your daughters to their sons, neither take their daughters for your sons, and never seek their peace or prosperity, that you may be strong and eat the good of the land, and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. And after all this has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, seeing that you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserve, and have given us such a remnant as this, Shall we break your commandments again and intermarry with the peoples who practice these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you consumed us, so that there should be no remnant nor any escape? O Lord, the God of Israel, you are just, for we are left a remnant that has escaped as it is today. Behold, we are before you in our guilt, for none can stand before you because of this. All right, we do have to keep going, but again, this is, this is the problem. God has always preserved a remnant of his people. And probably in Ezra's mind, while they have a lot going for them, they're a tiny little band, you know, they're a minority. And once again, it's this perennial problem of we're always forgetting the law and the instruction of the Lord. And God makes very clear that he holds us accountable for this. So, chapter 10, then the people come to him. I'm ahead of myself. And you see what they tell Ezra, 10 verse 2. We have broken faith with our God and have married foreign women from the peoples of the land. But even now there is hope for Israel in spite of this. Therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and their children, according to the counsel of my Lord and those who tremble at the commandment of our God, and let it be done according to the law. Arise, for it is your task and we are with you. Be strong and do it. Then Ezra arose and made the leading priests and Levites and all Israel take an oath that they would do as had been said. So they took the oath. This is the problem, or the difficulty. Uh, Ezra orders the people, and it's their idea, actually. But Ezra says, okay, so everybody married to a foreigner is going to be divorced. Marriages are going to be dissolved. Now the rub with that is, of course, you know everything else in the Bible teaches about marriage, that uh, marriage is marriage, 
But you be a Christian and your husband's a pagan or a, or a Muslim or whatever. Marriage is marriage, you know. You don't have to be married in the church for it to be a marriage. Marriage is something given to all people. You want the church to bless your marriage. but uh, And God, God is clear. One man, one woman, lifelong union. And there's certain benefits and purposes of marriage. Uh, God hates divorce. He's opposed to it. Um, and divorces that are permitted by God are permitted because of sin. So there are certain things that happen that break marriages. Uh, and, uh, and while those things should be forgiven, there is a breaking of faith that God does not obligate people in certain situations to remain married. This is kind of something else, though, right? So Ezra is in charge now, writing all the, you know, the certificates of divorce. Uh, it surprises people sometimes that, in a way, the Old Testament is actually, in terms of God's regulation of marriage, is a little more lax than the New. And it is worth remembering we live on the other side of the New, or I guess you should say, other side of the Old. Um, we're not bound by Old Testament laws and things of that nature. But uh, God does have to regulate marriage, and he does this, I believe it's Deuteronomy 24. Deuteronomy 24 is the passage that the Pharisees come and quote to Jesus. When they say, teacher, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? The, the letter of the Old Testament law says, yes, it is. Jesus, though, goes back even before Deuteronomy, and he says, but in the beginning it was not so. He appeals to a law that in a way is higher than Deuteronomy. He says God made a male and female. He joined them together. And he said what God has joined together let not man put asunder. So he gets them there. you know. So he says Moses had certain regulations for your hardness of heart. That was why it was allowed. That does not make it right. Uh, you can do something. It doesn't mean that you should. So I guess what I would tell you is... What you can't do with Ezra, not that you would, I mean you personally, but what you can't do with Ezra is you can't read Ezra and say, well, my husband ain't a Christian, and I've never really liked him, so now I can get rid of him, <laughs> okay? The Bible doesn't say that, okay? And in fact, St. Paul, 1 Corinthians 7, he talks about some of those kind of sensitive issues because it is a real problem. How do you live peaceably? Uh, how do you raise children with your spouse? if you're not on the same page about the things of God. As you know, and I know, marriage, which is a wonderful gift of God, is difficult enough without having those problems. So uh, it is, it's for our good that, uh, that we have that counsel from the scriptures. It's still a different thing than something that happens in a specific time and place in the Old Testament. So don't run wild with that one. But uh, that's what Ezra does, and Ezra is the teacher of the law. He is the scribe. Um, and uh, they dissolve the marriages because they don't want to contaminate the holy seed. They don't want the people to fall into idolatry. And, uh, and they do kind of have permission from God. They're, you can divorce your wife. Okay, well, then that's what they do. Um, but they have to preserve the integrity of the lineage. They have to preserve the integrity of their worship. And so God makes this allowance. He just does. Uh, yes, ma'am. I was just going to ask, so after they divorce, did they keep other people connected? That's a good question. I would assume they do. I wondered that, too. Because um, they still have to do what they need to do, you know, in terms of repopulating, you know, Judah and Jerusalem. And that's actually, that's a, that's a kind of continuous debate, uh, I mean, among, among Christian theologians. 99% uh, of the church is incredibly lax about divorce and remarriage. That is very much to our shame and our detriment. I think it's one reason the world doesn't take us seriously about sexual ethics is because conservative churches have let, you know, they've let the divorce thing go, basically. Not really fair, you know, not really right. Um, but it's an ongoing conversation. Okay, so God does allow divorce sometimes. What are the circumstances of that? And then the next question is, what, what, if anything, does he allow in terms of remarriage? Mm -hmm. And then you're in the point where you're like, so, so if we come to a conclusion that's different from our culture and the practice of most American churches, what does one do? You know, 
Um, my own view, whoever has been married before I serve as pastor, it's not really my affair. It wasn't on my watch, and I can't counsel or advise anybody about divorce or remarriage if I'm not their pastor. So I guess you call that grandfathering. What I do have a say in is uh, I can accept or decline any request for marriage, and I would explain why. Um, so yeah, so that's, that is, this is a question, and it's actually, it's a sticky question for Christians who want to be obedient to what the Bible says. You know, they're not looking for an out. They're like, well, I was validly divorced, that means I can get remarried, and so on and so forth. But uh, yeah, I would assume though they get remarried. That's what I would think. All right, anybody else? And by the way, I'm not saying, uh, you know, if you're married to a non-Christian, that doesn't mean that you can't live at peace. You can. You love one another, valid marriage, you have a lot of blessings from God. Uh, not, not talking down about that. Uh, I know how I've been blessed with a Christian wife, and I know what the scripture teaches. Uh, and uh, we just want to follow on a good and faithful path that protects us and our children. So that's all i got to say about that. But. All right. They confess their sins. They get divorces. It's all good. <laughs> that's more or less where we're going to stop um, with Ezra. That, that brings us to the... Oh, by the way, he names names. So at the end, the end of chapter 10, we've got everybody's names of everybody who had married a foreign wife and then got divorced. So, and he makes very clear which are priests and which are Levites. So, that's Ezra. Do you have any other thoughts about Ezra? I just think, you know, back then when the, all the divorce things going on, then they remarry, and then if they had children in that community, things must have been really confusing. It would be, and actually God, in one sense, makes it simple for him. He says, make no provision for your children from those marriages. They're like, that is really tough. <laughs> Think of the little kids, like, is that my uncle or is it my dad? I mean, it's like, golly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tough stuff. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so Nehemiah. Nehemiah follows chronologically. A lot of it has some overlap, but Nehemiah also is a little later, not by much, than Esther. I mean, I'm sorry, Ezra. It's all different E's. So Nehemiah is living in Persia, and uh, this is the first thing we learn about Nehemiah. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel. Remember, same city where Esther and Ahasuerus were. That Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah, because They've had the first return a long time ago now. They've had the return under Ezra. And now we're going to have like wave three going back from captivity. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed <coughs> by fire. And this is when Nehemiah realizes his mission in life. And he prays about it. This is the thing that distinguishes Nehemiah. Nehemiah is both a man of action and he's also a man of prayer. And Nehemiah, the book, is replete with all of these prayers. Nehemiah prays about everything. You know, he seeks God's will for everything. Uh, what Nehemiah takes it upon himself to do is he says, well, I want to go back and I'll help rebuild the wall. So things have fallen into some disrepair. Uh, the, uh, the Jewish people have not been exactly warmly received by the people who were living in Judah at the time. And then, you know, they kind of tank their welfare system by divorcing all their wives, you know, and getting rid of their children, I guess. But, um, just kidding. But, uh, so Nehemiah wants to go back. Now, Nehemiah, so he prays. He mentions at the end of chapter 1, he was the cupbearer to the Persian king. The cupbearer? Serve the drinks to the royal court. Uh, he made sure nothing was poisoned because this is, you know, 
no different than today, you know, with KGB or Mossad or whatever, go around poisoning people. So uh, to make sure the king was not poisoned, you know, he had the cupbearer, cupbearer tasted the wine, he handed it all out, you know, and his life was on the line if somebody did get a little bit of arsenic or cyanide or something. So what that tells us is that is, that might sound like a kind of, you know, you serve the drinks. Well, that's a, that's a great job. But um, you would have to be implicitly trusted by the king and the royal family to have an occupation like that. Um, and you are actually a person of influence. You're privy to a lot of things, you know. If you're, if you're in the dining room, you know, pouring the Chardonnay while the king is talking about who knows what. So Nehemiah, once again, has distinguished himself. He's faithful to God, and in being faithful to God, he's a faithful subject of the kingdom in which he finds himself, and God blesses him, and he uses Nehemiah's position to do that. Once again, like we've seen with Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Ezra, by being faithful in all of these things, that's the vehicle that God uses, you know, to accomplish his purposes and the good of his people. Because of that, then, Nehemiah has the ear of the king, and initially he's not going to say anything, but he's serving the king, uh, and uh, the king notices that he's completely downcast, and he asks him, what do you want? What would make you happy? So Nehemiah is bold to say, I would like to go back to Jerusalem because uh, the city of my fathers is being run down. Their defenses and their wall are being destroyed. The graves where all of my forefathers are buried are being desecrated. Um, and so I would like to go back and help them. So the king grants leave to Nehemiah. Nehemiah is not allowed to go and never come back, but he's allowed to have a little furlough. And uh, Artaxerxes gives to Nehemiah a lot of the same kind of things that he had given to Ezra. So this time he also gives him timber and uh, other building materials to help with the rebuilding and the renovation. And uh, as I recall, he also gives him more money. So gets everything that he needs. So the, the third wave of the return of the exiles happens under Nehemiah. Nehemiah is basically established then as the governor of Judah uh, when he returns to the land. All right, any questions about that? We are summarizing a lot, but uh, we kind of are supposed to do the whole book of Nehemiah. So, All right. So then, if you want to look at something specific, uh, chapter 2 in Nehemiah, verse 9. Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river. So he's going to the Persian-appointed officials there in Judah and gave them the king's letters, which has everything officially, formally spelled out, that Nehemiah is on the king's business. Now the king had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen, but when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. These are kind of, these are Nehemiah's adversaries. Great names, Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah. Always, not, not Tobiah the Ammonite, but Tobiah the Ammonite servant. So I guess Tobiah was his little henchman. You know, he was his toady because he's always the Ammonite servant. But, uh, Sanballat and Tobiah are both descended from these peoples native to the land that God said have nothing to do with. And so this is why they're opposed to Nehemiah and his rebuilding project. Uh, mostly what they do, uh, Sanballat and Tobiah, is they try to, they cast those aspersions, which we've also discussed before, uh, where they, they make these claims that the people, the Jewish people are rebellious people, they want to set up their own kingdom, they want their own king, and uh, the king should not do anything to support them. Of course, you don't say that to the king, but when you're a regional governor in the land of Judah, and you're very far beyond the river, you can kind of stir up that um, division among your own people. That's what they do. Uh, Nehemiah completely ignores them, but, uh, and he continues to pray, you know, as he should. He's praying that God would deliver them. Uh, what ends up happening then 
is they, they're, they're set about rebuilding the wall. And uh, it's not too much of a figure of speech to say what they do is they got the hammer in one hand and the sword in the other. They're always strapped while they're working because they need to defend themselves while they're building the wall uh, from all of these people who are hostile to them. Uh, so they, uh, let me see, and where is that, by the way? Yeah, let's look at four. Four is good. Chapter four. All right. Well, we there? We're tracking. All right. Now, when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, again, that's Nehemiah talking. It's first person. He was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite, there is not the Ammonite servant, was beside him and he said, yes, what are they building? What they are building, he says, what they are building, if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. And then Nehemiah, speaking to us, he's praying, Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. So we built the wall, and all the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. All right, they realize they're surrounded by their enemies, that they can be in a somewhat tenuous situation. Um, So they keep working, and Nehemiah keeps praying. You see that again in verse 9. As this plot is kind of mounting against them, we prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. Then verse 10. In Judah, it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There is too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. And our enemies said they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. At that time, the Jews who lived near them came from all directions and said to us ten times, You must return to us. So in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in open places, I stationed the people by their clans with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, and to the officials, and to the rest of the people. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. So they round up the people, and uh, they have, they've got some guys building and some guys standing watch, so they can complete the rebuilding of the wall. When our, verse 15, when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. From that day on, half of my servants worked on construction and half held the spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah who were building on the wall. Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. And each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread, and we are separated on the wall far from one another. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there, our God will fight for us. That God fights for us is something that we see throughout uh, the Old Testament. And I gave you a few of those. This is what uh, God reminds the people in the days of the Exodus. Um, Exodus 14, when Moses says, the Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. Exodus 14 is when they finally got out of Egypt, and then they come up against the Red Sea, and they know that Pharaoh is hot on their heels, and complain, complain, cry, cry, you know. And uh, Moses says, no, the Lord himself fights for you. So all you have to do is shut up. And, uh, you know, God intervenes. You know, he parts the Red Sea, brings the children of Israel through on dry ground, and, uh, and he proves to them 
time and time again uh, that uh, God does fight for us. Now, sometimes the way that God fights for us is the weapon is still in your hand, so to speak, but he's the one who guides its success. So sometimes there are miraculous things, you know, that you and I could not do, that there's no other explanation. God parts the Red Sea, Lord fights for you. Sometimes it's like with Nehemiah, where the Lord fights for you, and he fights for you through the sword that you've got strapped to your side. And wisdom knows the difference. But what, what these things hold in common is that we seek God. Uh, we seek him in prayer the way that Nehemiah does. We trust his word. Um, and then we realize that in both scenarios, in the miraculous and in what seems to us, you know, the ordinary and just the things that we have to do, that all of those things are in the merciful hands of God, that he directs them and he defends us. We're getting to that time of year. Soon we will sing one of the greatest hymns of all time, always on the Sunday closest to October the 31st, right? Uh, the stanza goes, but for us fights the valiant one whom God himself elected. See, Luther plays on that imagery in A Mighty Fortress, that uh, the God, not only is he the place of refuge, you know, he's the fortress, he's the castle, uh, but uh, Jesus fights for us on our behalf because we're not able to stand against the devil and so Jesus fights for us. Also says he's by our side upon the plain with his good gifts and spirit. Uh, because we live as Christians, we live in a state of war. You know, it's a state of spiritual warfare. Uh, the devil has designs to destroy us. And so without, without Jesus leading his help and his defense, um, you know, we would be lost. So it's, it's the same kind of thing when they're building the wall. And Nehemiah reminds them, we're all going to do battle, uh, but the Lord fights for us. You know, the Lord protects us and gives us success. And if, if Nehemiah and the people had not been inclined that way, there would have been no success. Right? And Ezra knows this too. This is why, once again, you know, Ezra, when he goes, he makes sure we got everything we need. When the sins and that stuff comes up, we address it, we confess it, we repent. Uh, because without that part, the other part's not going to succeed. And it's like the psalmist says, uh, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain who build it. Doesn't matter. All our plans, everything else comes to nothing. Um, unless the foundation of what we're doing is based in what God himself says. Anything about that? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I should have said that. It's the wall around the city of Jerusalem. Yeah, they needed their defenses. And, uh, so they were protecting the Jewish people against the Persians? No, against uh, the, the other... Well, I guess in a way you could say that because some of, there's some dissension in the ranks. But, um, but like Sanballat and Tobiah, they, they're natives. They, they're serving you know, with the Persian seal of approval. But their loyalty really is, you know, to themselves and their people. So those are the people that actually have to deal with. It's these people. And, you know, at this point, Judah, and then up to the north where you have Samaria, now it's filled with people who are not Jews. They don't worship the one true God. And now all of these people have come back, you know. So they come back to their land. They rebuild their temple, all of this stuff. And then they're like, by the way, we don't want anything to do with you and we don't want to marry you. Please leave me alone. So, yeah, it's kind of like the Palestine thing. You know, not very pleased that these people are back. So they have all of these enemies aligned against them. So, yeah, it's those people, Samaritans and other people in Judah, that they're going, that's who they're building their defenses against. So, yeah, good question. Okay, anybody else? Okay, as we continue blitzing, uh, Nehemiah chapter 8. By the way, good news, Nehemiah chapter 6, they finished the wall. And it only takes them 52 days, which is not bad, you know, when you got a sword in one hand and you got your hammer in the other hand. But God grants them success. What they then do after that, and where we pick up in 8, is the people... They, they hold this special Sabbath. They gather 
so that they can hear God's word. Now, Ezra is still around. He's still the main teacher of the people. So Ezra, uh, he expounds the law of Moses to them. And we could look at it at, uh, maybe we'll kind of, yeah, we'll look through it. You'll see why this is particularly gratifying to me. Chapter 8. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. Not the one with Nixon, but the water gate into the city. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood all of these gentlemen. Verse 5, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, and he opened it. And as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Verse 8, they read from the book, from the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. That, in a nutshell, is basically church. You see that? Uh, you've got the preacher, and, and there's other little details in here. Uh, they have their responses. They say, Amen. He's standing on the platform, kind of like a pulpit. Uh, he gives them the sense. That is to say that he, he interprets and he preaches. Um, and it's the scriptures that they're hearing. Uh, and they're bowing their heads and worshiping the Lord. It seems awfully liturgical, I suppose. But verse 9, And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet. <laughs> That's very calming. For this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing, because they had understood the words that were declared to them. They're convicted by their sins, in other words. Uh, they're convicted by their sins, but they see God's faithfulness. And so they reassure the people, the joy of the Lord is your strength, that God has been gracious to you. He has forgiven your sins. He's preached this word to you. So go and eat the fat and, and drink the wine. So that's the consolation of the gospel, I suppose. Uh, the other thing they do is they celebrate the Feast of Booths. They make very sure under Ezra's direction, that we are doing the things God said to do. We saw that uh, last time, you might recall. Uh, that's the feast that uh, God had given the Old Testament people where they built their little tabernacles to remember, you know, that they were sojourners, they dwelt in the wilderness, God dwelt in the big tent, right, in the tabernacle, and uh, that he was going to bring them into their land. So now they're in their land, God has rebuilt his temple and the wall, he's been faithful to his promises, uh, and, uh, and so they, they keep these feasts. Anything about that? Once again, seems like everything's going pretty well, don't you think? And, you know, I mean, you know how life is. Uh, there's, a, there's other things definitely in the book of Nehemiah. Um, if we go to the end of Nehemiah, though, uh, they do dedicate the wall, by the way, because it's good to dedicate things, make them holy. Unfortunately, Nehemiah is not there because Nehemiah, his, his furlough has ended. He has to go back to King Artaxerxes. People who date things more carefully than I do, you can kind of use some of the dates and stuff internally in the book to figure some of these things out. I just gave you the summary, I believe, maybe I did, Maybe it's not here. Uh, Nehemiah, I believe, comes 
He comes first to Jerusalem about 445. Yeah, about 445. Uh, he's there for, I believe, 12 years, which is an awfully long furlough, but I guess it shows how implicitly the king trusted them. And then, if I remember, he returns, is it 425? I think it's 425. Uh, the point being, he returns, and uh, when he comes back, he is most displeased because, surprise, surprise, they've gotten off the rails again. The, there's more detail about that in the book of Nehemiah. Uh, Nehemiah also has to deal with the intermarriage problem. He finds out uh, that uh, the priests are not doing their job exactly when it comes to the sacrifices. He finds out that the Jews um, are exacting interest on loans from one another. This is condemned by God in the Old Testament. And actually, the entire Christian tradition for roughly 1,600 years said, yeah, charging interest on loans is a sin. That's stealing. And it's unnatural. The reason that it's unnatural is that money is not supposed to make more money. When somebody is poor and they borrow 20 bucks from you, they owe you 20 bucks. They don't owe you 25 of interest. Uh, now, our entire world economically would collapse if we were faithful to what God had said. But it would be a good opportunity to, you know, creatively find solutions to really big problems that we ignore. If that means like, you know, venture capitalism or whatever, whatever. But uh, anyway, Nehemiah, he knows it's wrong and he holds him to account for it being wrong. So he comes back and he's like, uh, got to fix all this again. So he does what he can. And, uh, I mean, he's, he's satisfied, but he is not, um, he's not complacent about it. Because what we see toward the end of chapter 13 and the end of the book. The last two verses, 30 and 31, Nehemiah says, Thus I cleanse them from everything foreign, and I establish the duties of the priests and Levites, each in his work. And I provided for the wood offerings at appointed times and for the first fruits. Remember me, O oh my God, for good. Now, in terms of just the straight historical narrative, that's the end of the Old Testament. That's the last event that we really have. Nehemiah returns again to Jerusalem. He tries to set things in order, and it's just his prayer. Remember me, O oh my God, for my good. Uh, Nehemiah, maybe unlike the people, still has some estimation of his own personal sinfulness. Uh, he knows that. He knows he stands in, needs of God, in need of God's mercy and also that um, there are things that he has to do to be faithful. He needs God's mercy and his remembrance for that. So it kind of ends on that note, you know, in which people are still sinful. God's people have every advantage. The scriptures, the covenant, the worship, God, the temple, they return to the land, God has been with them, that he's been their defense as they rebuild and renovate and everything. And we're still kind of in the same place where we always are, you know, where they fall into sin, they're faithless, they need somebody to straighten them out, uh, who's sent by God. Uh, while you can say, well, yeah, that's how life is, we're not supposed to be content with that. Right, that cycle does need to be broken. Um, and the law and the worship and all of that is only as good as far as it goes. You know? But these things, as we've seen, we're always anticipating the coming of the deliverer who's going to rescue God's people. And, um, of course, that being Jesus our Lord. Anything you want to say about Nehemiah? It's a good prayer. You want to memorize a short prayer? Remember me, oh my God, for my good. Um, all right, so we're going to cheat. We really are done with the narrative, but uh, the, our curriculum wisely said you need to say a little bit about Malachi. Malachi is a great name, by the way. Yes. Malachi, by the way. This, this is important for our purposes. Malachi means my messenger. Um, Malach is angel in Hebrew or messenger, same word, because the angels are the messengers of God. So whether Malachi is the guy's name or he's just given the title, my messenger, 
Why Malachi? Um, it's not clear. Malachi does prophesy, generally speaking, in the time of Nehemiah. One of the reasons that we know that is because he addresses all these same abuses that Nehemiah and Ezra you know, are trying to put to rights. And there's a lot in Malachi. It's a short book. It's deceptively short. It's four chapters. And Malachi especially wants to hold the, the priests and the Levites to task for the things that they've done wrong. He mentions other things too, um, including an, an Old Testament regulation, but a good principle for us, uh, tithe. And uh, if you don't, do you think a man can rob God? A very popular message that Malachi was preaching. Um, so it's in the context of that, of him trying to address the, the leadership um, of the temple, that he tells him, he said, you know, next time it ain't going to be Nehemiah that comes and straightens this out. Ultimately, God is going to come. And when the day of the Lord comes, he, there's a note of judgment throughout all of this. He talks about how the day of the Lord is coming, it's burning like an oven. He's going to separate the stubble from the wheat, which we hear again later on in the words of John the Baptist. He's going to throw the junk in the fire. He's going to thresh out the threshing floor, and, uh, and he's going to put everything to right. God himself will come and sort that out. So that's kind of the, the law aspect of it. That's not the whole message of Malachi, however. So I did give you these two quotations. I think they're, for our purposes, most important in Malachi. Speaking through Malachi, God says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. So knowing what you know at this point. So first of all, he's saying, behold, I'm sending my Malachi, right? See, there's his name. He's like, I'm sending Malachi. But he's not talking about himself. I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Uh, that is language that you also find in Isaiah 40. Uh, the beginning of Isaiah 40, uh, a voice says in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord make his path straight, and every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain be made low, and the crooked places a plain um, for the highway, preparing the highway of the Lord, and all flesh will see the salvation of our God. When the Pharisees come to John the Baptist and they say, who are you? He says, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. John is the fulfillment of what Isaiah and Malachi prophesy that he's the last one. See, Malachi is not really the last Old Testament prophet. That would be John the Baptist. But he's the last one who proclaims, he, he's not just proclaiming there'll be another prophet, but what Malachi is talking about is the day of the Lord comes. The next guy who comes is God, right? And so the day of the Lord comes when Jesus himself is born into our flesh um, and he, uh, he accomplishes our redemption. So there's John that he's talking about. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And then the very last words of the Old Testament, in Malachi 4, 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Now we saw the old Elijah remember, Elijah the Tishbite, and the, they had that expectation that Elijah would return. We talked about that a little bit. Jesus tells us, you know, John the Baptist is the Elijah who is to come. He is the one, he's the final great prophet before the Lord himself comes. And that is basically the next thing that happens, you know, in the Gospels. When you flip over to the New Testament, uh, Mark, he skips Jesus' birth, we go to his adulthood, and Mark just says John was there. He was in the wilderness. He was preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, and he fulfilled the word of Isaiah, a voice is crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Um, that's Elijah the prophet. And he comes, once again, you see, before the day of the Lord. That tells you who Jesus is. The next guy who comes, the one that he, he foretells, is the Lord himself in the flesh. And what the Elijah will do, he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, 
lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Now that's the end of the Old Testament. So you do have that note of judgment, uh, but you have God, he, he is sending his final messenger. You know, we've tracked through all the prophets, most of them beat their head against a wall. You know? uh, John loses his head over it, but uh, he's sent them all the prophets, he's given them all the prophecies, all the promises, and so finally in the days of Malachi, he says one more messenger. That'll be the new Elijah who is to come. And then comes the Lord. The Lord is coming to stave off that judgment. You know, uh, John is preparing the way, turning the hearts of fathers to their children, the hearts of children to their fathers, so that I don't come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Uh, and uh, Jesus stands in that gap. You know, he comes... He, he fulfills all the words of, of the scriptures and the prophets um, that he might show us how God really is, that he might save us. Any questions about that or comments? So two things before we go. Uh, the one is, I hope you enjoyed our two-year, <laughs> was it a frolic? Marathon? journey uh, through the Old Testament. I've enjoyed it immensely. And, you know, as a young pastor, it's given me a lot of experience in teaching through some of those things by taking the shortcut of you don't have to do every word of every book. So that was good. Good to know how to, you know, summarize and all of that. Um, so I've enjoyed it. I want you to think about, you don't have to prepare a statement or anything, but next time, next week when we get together, um, any thoughts that you have, reflections about our study of the Old Testament um, and how that was for you? You know, I'd just like to, like to hear. Because um, we spent a lot of time in Bible class doing it, so did you, did you enjoy it? Were you edified by it? Nobody's going to be like, no. Uh, but yeah, so, well, good. I'm glad. You know, that was, that was the goal. Our, our goal really has been a little more familiarity with the Old Testament. It's a, it's a long timeline. A lot of names, a lot of people, a lot of events and things like that. It is hard to keep track of all of those things. The best thing to do is always to have like a yearly refresher, you know, in your daily Bible reading. Uh, because we're just as far removed as we are from the New Testament, we're that much farther, you know, from the Old. And it's just a different world for us. And yet it's important because it proclaims and points to Christ, and it gives us Jesus, you know, in the Old Testament. So we don't want to neglect it. But yeah, just think about your own reflections on our going through the Old Testament. Then, then the one other thing is, I mentioned last time, before we did another book of the Bible, we would do something topical and... Uh, Please let me know if you have any other suggestions, questions, recommendations, whatever. Um, I'm happy to hear those. There is nothing set in stone, although based on some of our conversation last week and a few other conversations that I've had with people outside of Bible class, uh, I'm getting in my mind, not to prejudice you, but uh, I'm feeling like doing a topical study it's a big topic, but we're going to dilute it um, on the end times. I think there's a lot of questions and misinformation about the end times. That's not y'all's fault. It's just part of being an American Christian, I'm afraid. Um, now there are things happening in the news that make people go. They start, they start it again. They're talking about the end times because they want to talk about Israel, Palestine, the Middle East, and all that stuff. Don't want to say that has little to do with the end times, but it doesn't quite have the role people think. So I think it would be, I think it would be good and important. So we would talk about stuff about Israel. Uh, we would talk about everybody's favorite. We want to talk about the Antichrist and the mark of the beast. We want to talk about the rapture and how it doesn't exist. Uh, but what the truth that Jesus is coming again, visibly, he will raise the dead and will live in the new creation. And how you kind of navigate some of this stuff that's in, in the water in our culture and kind of in our cultural Christianity when it comes to end time stuff. Uh, 
if you would be interested in that, that's what we'll, we'll do. Unless you, you have something burning, you got a burning question or desire, we can, we can do that too, you know. But uh, what we're not going to do is we're not going to, we're not going to go through the entire book of Revelation. The truth about end time stuff is that it's diffuse, you know, throughout the Bible. Revelation has, obviously it's got something to do with the end times, but uh, there, there's a lot that we would draw from Jesus and St. Paul, and also from the Old Testament, that is more straightforward and gives us a clearer picture of what we're actually supposed to expect. Because Revelation is a highly symbolic book, and we get into trouble, actually. That's where some of the craziness comes from. We get in trouble when you, you try to read Revelation like a newspaper, you know, for world events. It's not good. Not good. So if I've piqued your interest, that's what we'll do. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sounds good to Judy. Hearing no objections, no nays. Uh, okay. Good deal. So we'll, we'll start something like that next week. Um, if, you're, if you'd like to, you can also share with us about your reflections on Old Testament stuff. Uh, take, home, take home your sheet so you can read about that 400 years between the Old and the New Testament. I think you'll find that very interesting. And uh, Jeff's funeral is tomorrow. Um, everything's here. Visitation starts at 9, funeral at 11, going to the cemetery, and then coming back to eat. So 11 o'clock, funeral begins. And I feel like there's something else. Maybe there wasn't. No, tell me no, there's nothing else. Okay. All right. Well, we're going we're gonna to say goodbye for now to the Trumps and hope you have a safe trip. And uh, so you're welcome. And we'll see you again, the good Lord willing, when it warms up again. <laughs> Appreciably. All right. Let's close with prayer. Gracious Lord, our Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you. Uh, of the revelation of your truth that you give to us in the Old Testament scriptures. We thank you that they proclaim uh, the coming of your Son, uh, who dwells now in our midst as our Messiah, as our Savior from sin. We pray that as we study your word, um, that as we live this life to which you've called us, that all of these things would be proclamation of Christ and him alone. We pray uh, that as we uh, study these things, as we apply them, uh, that you would be with us for our good as your servant Nehemiah prayed. We thank you for your grace. Uh, we thank you that you draw us to repentance, uh, that we might be pardoned and made whole anew again. We ask uh, that you would always give us your spirit who accomplishes these things by your word and sacrament. We pray that you would give us safety and protection in all of the places that we go, uh, that wherever we go we might glorify your holy name, in which we pray. Amen. Okay, thank you very much.